Welcome to our next operating systems lecture. In today's lecture we'll talk about hardware resources and computer architecture and how they relate to operating systems. So an overview of today's lecture. First we'll take a look at a very basic structure of a typical computer system like what you might have seen in an introductory computer architecture lecture. So we'll talk about basic elements and how instruction execution works. And then we'll talk about more recent developments arriving at the computers we have today. So we start at the old von Neumann principle and then take a look at how modern computers actually diverged from this. So we have things like a memory hierarchy. So we have more complex memory systems in modern computers. We can have multiple processes. We have new ways of communication. We have heterogeneous systems with additional components. And one very important thing that has been gaining importance over the last couple of decades is non-functional properties. And then we'd also talk about especially security and virtual memory. So this picture is a very simplified picture of a von Neumann architecture computer, which is not describing a real computer that you can build now uh, or buy nowadays. Uh, it might still be valid for some very, very simple microcontroller systems you can use today, like an Arduino with an AVR processor, but in general, systems have become more complex. Nevertheless, it's a good idea to take a look at that first. So we have three major components in our computer system, the central processing unit or processor, a unified memory that contains instructions and data, and one or more devices for doing input and output. So the CPU can address either memory locations and it can fetch instructions from memory or it can fetch data from memory. And the CPU can also send requests to IO devices and then read or write data. And then we have optional components. First one is interrupts. So essentially a device can tell the CPU whenever an IO request that was started some time ago has finished. And additionally, we have something we call DMA or direct memory access. So DMA means that a device can transfer data, for example, read from a device directly into memory without going through the CPU first and then the CPU writing this data into memory. So this enables you to leave the CPU free for other tasks while all your DMA is happening in the background. Now we have another component here, which is really important. These interrupts, which I already mentioned on the previous slide. So interrupts are an important component of modern systems because interrupts enable us to waste less compute time. So if you didn't have interrupts, your access to IO devices would have to use a method which we call polling. And polling just means that you send an IO request like here, you write a command to a device, and then you check the device in a loop. And as long as the device has not indicated that it has finished its task, so it's not ready, you just do nothing except waiting and checking and waiting and checking. And finally, when this condition no longer holds, so our device is ready, it has retrieved some data, for example, we requested, then we can read this data from our device. As you can see, depending on the speed of your IO device, this loop here can take quite a lot of time to execute. And while you're doing this, your computer cannot do anything else. So you're wasting compute time and you're wasting energy. And essentially your computer is less responsive. So you would want to have a way to improve this. And this way to improve it is by using interrupts. So an interrupt, as you can see, is a separate, usually physical line. So a signal on a chip or on a PCB that goes from an IO device to the CPU and which is just a signal that indicates if the signal is active, our device wants to indicate something to the CPU. So for example, a data transfer has finished, which might have taken a long time or an error has been uh, shown, uh, showing up. So our CPU needs to be able to handle this. So with interrupts, our device can notify the program asynchronously when data is ready, then our process gets a bit more complex. So essentially we can write a command to a device. Then we can do something completely different. And then when the interrupt comes, we don't continue in our program we were executing doing something else. 
but our CPU changes the flow of execution and jumps to another location in memory to handle the interrupt, where you can, for, for example, then read data from the device. Whereas if you had used polling, you would have had to wait. Here with interrupts, you can do something else, which is useful in between. Now this makes your system more responsive and makes it easier to program stuff, but it's more complex actually to get the software right, especially if, it, if you have multiple interrupts just occurring in the system. So to go a bit into detail here, we see that our CPU is uh, consisting of two major parts. So we have the data pass, which uh, has the registers of your CPU and the ALU doing the calculations. And you have the control unit that actually determines what the data pass is actually doing in any given moment. So this CPU is connected to our memory and to one or more IO devices using buses. So the major buses here are the address bus. So our CPU can generate addresses from the control or from the data unit. And then it can transfer data. For example, our control unit can generate an instruction address to memory, and then our memory delivers an instruction back to the control unit. The control unit can start executing this instruction, and this involves writing some register value to memory. So our data path then generates another address uh, where we want to store our data, sends it to the memory, and then writes data to the memory using the data bus. In addition to the address and the data bus, we can usually have a control bus in our system. This contains meta information. For example, if the success we want to perform is a read or write access, if an interrupt has happened and so on. This is not shown here for the sake of simplicity. What's important here is that our single CPU has control of the bus with the exception of being able to perform DMA, then you'd have a separate DMA controller component that would need to coordinate bus success with the CPU. But these are computers that have existed until, let's say, the 1960s. And in these computers, instruction execution was very simple. So up on the top left here, we see our computer system and our buses again. And on the right hand side, we see what's going on inside our CPU. So our control unit, for example, has three separate units, a fetch unit that fetches instructions from memory, a decode unit that figures out what this instruction is actually going to do, and an execute unit that actually calculates and implements the side effects of this instruction. To do this, our control unit has a program counter inside the CPU and an instruction register. So a usual instruction execution flow goes like this. We have a value in our program counter like 3050 now. This value is sent over our address bus to our main memory. And we give the indication that we want to read some information. We get this bit pattern back. And this bit pattern is then sent back to our control unit and stored in the instruction register. So that was our fetch process. And in the subsequent stages, our instructions then decoded, so the CPU figures out, oh, it's a move command, it moves the constant 42 into register R1, and then it can execute it. Optionally, if you have any memory access in your instructions, so for example, you want to store a register value to main memory, the execute unit would actually take care of data transfer from the data path to your memory reading or writing. So the algorithm that is performed in our very simple CPU model is shown down here. So when we start our CPU, it is reset. So our PC is initialized to some reset address. For example, it can be simply address zero. So it starts at the beginning of memory. And the first action is a fetch action. So it passes the program counter to our memory here. It reads back the value from our memory into the instruction register. And then it has an internal flag that just indicates if it should continue running, a halt flag. We set this to false, so we indicate for now we want our CPU to continue running. And as long as this halt flag is not true, we execute the instruction we just read into the instruction register. Then we go to our next instruction, for example, here, with, like in very many risk architectures, our next instruction is just four instructions away. So we go from 3050 to 3054, and then we read 
the next memory location into our instruction register here. So we would read here to here. And our loop starts again by executing the next instruction that was read until we actually set the halt flag in our execution or, which is not shown here, our CPU decides to change control flow. So we have something like a jump instruction, which essentially loads the PC with a new value. Now, as I said, all of this is pretty ancient technology. So computers until the maybe late 1960s or mid 1970s worked like this. But this simple model of execution only works efficiently if the speed of the memory actually is equal to the speed of the CPU. This was the case until about 1980. So here in this diagram on the bottom, you see the development of CPU and memory speeds starting with 1980 until 10 years ago. So uh, you see in 1980, both had the same speed. So whenever the CPU required a new instruction to be executed, the memory could deliver this new instruction in time. So they were synchronous and everyone was happy. Now the problem is, that semiconductor developments didn't go the same way for CPUs and for memory chips. So CPUs managed to get significantly faster. So you see that's this steep curve here. So you see that, for example, in 2010, CPUs were on average about like 10 to maybe 20,000 times faster than the CPU you could buy in 1980. However, the memory speed only increased about like 6% on average per year. So when we started with a memory that was as fast as the CPU in 1980, it only got about 10 times faster in the last uh, yeah, 30 years, whereas the CPU got 10,000 times faster. So whenever the CPU now needs a new instruction for main memory, it has to wait quite a long time until this data this bit pattern, which makes up our instruction, is actually returned from main memory. So what our CPU has to do, because it doesn't have any other instructions to execute, it has to do busy waiting or polling until the memory actually has returned the value. Now, this would mean we have very fast CPUs, but they couldn't really make use of their fast performance just because our memory was too slow. So we had to do something about this. And what we did is we introduced what we call a memory hierarchy. So what was introduced were additional types of memory into our computer. And these memories are called caches. Caches from the French word cache to hide something. And these memories hide the slow memory speed of our large main memory. The problem with caches is that if you want to build fast caches, you can only afford to build relatively small caches. So a cache is a small but fast intermediate level of memory that sits somewhere between your CPU and your main memory. Now, because caches are small, they can usually only hold a partial copy of the whole main memory. You can have unified caches, which can hold data and instructions, but for very many CPUs, you have so-called separate caches for instructions and data, which enable you to make your computer even more uh, fast to execute. Now, as I said, caches are relatively uh, expensive technology. They're expensive to manufacture. That's why you can only afford to have small caches on your CPU. Now, as the divergence between CPU speeds and main memory speeds increased, a single level of cache, just one level of intermediate memory, wasn't enough, so later generations of hardware introduced multiple levels of cache, level one, level two, maybe level three cache. Each of these cache levels is bigger than the previous one, so it has more memory capacity, but it is slower. So essentially what we have is a hierarchy level of memories from L1 cache, L2 cache, L3 cache, and finally ending up at our main memory. Now, why does this idea of caches work at all? Now, caches work efficiently. Remember, they only store a very small part of your main memory. And they work efficiently due to so-called locality principles. And there's two locality principles which are important here. The first one is temporal locality. So uh, it has been investigated that a program uh, that accesses some part of memory is likely to access the same memory soon thereafter. 
For example, you're just increasing a variable in memory, so it's the same memory location one after the other, and you just add one to it, or you're executing code in a loop. So for example, your loop only is like 16 bytes of instructions worth, and you're executing this a thousand times. So after your loop has been copied into your cache memory, you can execute it with the full speed of a cache memory instead of waiting for slow main memory. Now the other sort of locality is so-called spatial locality. So it's also known that a program that accesses some part of memory is very likely to access nearby memory locations soon thereafter. So one simple example we've already seen is instruction execution. So unless we do not uh, branch, uh, unless we do branch in our code, we execute instructions sequentially. So we read address 1000, then address 1004, then address 1008, and so on. So if we load information into cache a block at a time, which might have 128 bytes, you only need to wait for main memory once at the beginning when something is not in cache, and then afterwards you can execute with the full speed of your cache due to spatial locality until you reach the end of that block in your cache. So this gives us a memory hierarchy like this. We have an L1 cache. This might have like tens of kilobytes at an access time of five nanoseconds. We have maybe an L2 cache with maybe a hundred kilobyte and 15 nanoseconds of access time. And then we have main memories in the order of megabytes or gigabytes, which has maybe around a hundred nanoseconds. On top, you see the fastest storage elements in our system. These are the processor internal registers. And because we usually have to read multiple registers and write a register at the same time when executing an instruction, these are very fast, so maybe in the order of a single nanosecond, but they are very small because they're very expensive to implement in that speed on chip. So the further you're away from the CPU, the more your size of your memory hierarchy level increases, but the speed of accessing this, so from sending a request, I want this data to getting the result decreases. So you have the fastest memories inside of your CPU chip in your registers. Very often your level one cache is also on chip. In modern CPUs also level two cache might be on chip. Other systems implement it as a separate chip on board. Then you have your RAM. And finally of course as the last level in your storage hierarchy which is not actually shown here is a disk which is again orders of magnitude slower than your RAM main memory. Memory can have additional impacts, and these additional impacts are so-called non-functional properties. So memory has a large influence on some of these non-functional properties, and some of these non-functional properties can be execution time, so average, best, or worst case, worst case performance to execute a piece of code, throughput and latencies, but also things like power and energy consumption, which are very important, for example, for embedded and IoT applications, and reliability and security. So these non-functional properties depend on many parameters of our memory system, for example, on the cache architecture, on the memory type, and the alignment and aliasing of data. So what you see on the top right hand side here is from a previous publication of ours where you can actually see the memory energy consumption and for different benchmarks here. And you can see depending on the type of memory, like uh, for example SRAM or DRAM, your energy consumption differs significantly. The lower right hand side here shows a diagram which uh, gives indications about the time to access a list element in a loop. And as long as the uh, number of list elements is small enough here, you see everything fits in cache. So you can have like five cycles access time per list element. And when you exceed the side of the cache, the cache actually has to be reloaded with additional information. So your access times go up here, for example, by a factor of three. And when you finally exceed the size of the next level cache, you have another factor of two uh, in your access times. So essentially you can figure out by the size of the data you're working on. Like for example, this here would be uh, two to the 14th. So like uh, 16 kilobytes. And this would be two to the 20th, so one megabyte. So we have 
16 kilobytes of level one cache. If you stay inside of 16 kilobytes, you're very fast with five cycles. If you manage to keep your data inside of one megabyte, you're still in level two cache. And if you're over one megabyte, you need to access main memory, which is quite a bit more slow. So essentially, how you lay out your data in memory, how you access your memory in which pattern, really depends on how long your program takes to execute. Now, we have uh, this development of increasing processor speeds. So people got used to just being able to buy a faster processor year after year. And this is a consequence of so-called Moore's law. Moore's law is not a law like a physical law. It's rather an observation already done in 1965. And this observation said that the number of transistors in a dense integrated circuit doubles about every two years. So you can find variations of Moore's law, like it might double every 18 months, uh, but it's about uh, in that time scale. So with this increasing density, the distance between your transistors on chip is getting smaller. So if it's getting smaller, your electrical signals on your chip need less time to actually propagate from one transistor to another. So your circuits also getting faster. So you get an increase, an overall increase in CPU speed and not only a larger number of transistors due to these smaller semiconductor structures uh, according to Moore's law. Now you see uh, modern CPUs like, uh, for example, the Apple M1 chip are manufactured in uh, so-called structure sizes which are in the single nanometer dig uh, digits, like five or seven nanometers. And the problem is that this is about the size of like 10 atoms. So the development of semiconductors and the shrinking of uh, the semiconductor transistor sizes, according to Moore's law, is hitting physical limitations. Because, well, obviously it's difficult to go below one atom, but even at the sizes of 10 or several dozen atoms, very strange effects like tunneling electrons or something show up that actually make energy consumption uh, more difficult to control and make chips less reliable. That's the reason why CPU frequencies have stuck at around three gigahertz for the last like almost 10 years. And you can see this in this diagram here. So even while the number of transistors is still increasing, we can't get more single thread performance and we can't get higher frequencies out of our CPU chips. But one thing we can actually do, and you see this down here, we can use these transistors for something else. So what is this something else we can use our transistors for? Well, the first thing that was tried was to increase the size of caches. This works to some extent. For example, in early spark station processors from some microsystems, uh, these were delivered in with very, very large caches at that time, I think about eight megabytes. And when these machines were delivered to the customers, the customers almost directly complained that the computer was crashing all the time. Now these caches are memory cells consisting of a number of transistors, and they're very suspicious to uh, cosmic rays and electromagnetic interference. So whenever uh, some uh, one of these effects actually occurs, it's very likely that it can flip a bit in your cache. And flipping a bit means it would turn, for example, one instruction into another one, which might cause your computer to crash, or it might cause a number into a, uh, changing a number into a different number, which would mean you get incorrect results, which is actually worse than if your computer would crash, because you might just not figure out that this error has occurred and just continue working with your incorrect results. So another solution uh, than just putting bigger caches on the chip was to put more processes on chip. So before putting more process on, uh, processes on a single chip, we already had computers that had several processor chips, separate chips and uh, several sockets on our main board. Uh, so these early high-end systems already used something like this, but by putting the processors on the chip, we could enable faster communication between the processors. And so the new trend is instead of increasing frequencies, where we just hit our limits here, what we do 
is we increase the number of processors. So if you look at your mobile phone, you maybe have a quad or an eight core processor already in your mobile phone and even very small and cheap embedded systems uh, can have multiple cores for a couple of dollars. Now, this looks like this then. So we have several CPUs. Each CPU has a bit of cache. That's the second one. That's the third one. But if we still keep our rest, uh, the rest of our system infrastructure identical, we still have one memory here and maybe a couple of devices. So when all the CPUs are executing some code simultaneously, there will be conflicts accessing the bus. And especially as we know that the memory throughput was already the limiting factor here, now we have a uh, to have a memory throughput that has to satisfy the demands of n processes, so like three in our case here. What's even worse is that our software now has to support execution on multiple processes. And if you remember your first semester programming course, all you did was write sequential programs. Now a sequential program is based on the fact, obviously, that you execute one instruction after the other. That's exactly what one of these CPUs is doing. So if you want to make use of the CPU power you have by yeah, making use of three CPUs, the easiest thing you can do is have three independent tasks, like you have uh, a compiler on the first task, an MP3 player on the second, and a Bitcoin miner on the third one. That would work, but that doesn't accelerate your one application you want to work with, for example, your compiler that just compiles a large piece of software. So essentially, to make use of all three CPUs for a single piece of software, you have to find methods to what we call parallelize the software. So you have to determine things that can be run independently inside of a single program. And so your software now has to be either written by hand or transformed by automatic processes to support execution on multiple processes. A additional problem that's showing up here is that we have caches and caches contain copies of main memory contents. Now if two CPUs operate on the same data in main memory and have copies of this data in our caches, what might happen is that these copies are no longer coherent so that CPU 1 has a different idea of its copy of the main memory than CPU 2 does. And so when one of the CPUs writes back data into main memory from its cache, well, the value of the other CPU is incorrect, or at least it diverges from this. And so we have very difficult to find bugs in our software. So we need to have mechanisms to actually what we call snoop the caches or the cache transfers over our buses to figure out if some value is changed in a cache, and then we have to update information in all the other caches that hold a copy of that value. This makes our hardware much more complex again, and we'll have to have mechanisms to cope with this. So what can we do about this? Now, memory throughput, as we've seen, has to satisfy demands of multiple processors. So what we could do is to provide each processor with its own memory. So as we see it here, CPU 1 not only has its cache, it also has its own main memory and it just uses the bus to access devices. And CPU 2 also has its own main memory and its own cache. Uh, but what happens if CPU 2 needs to access a value in the memory of CPU 1? Then it needs to go over the bus and needs to request values from that memory and this means it takes much longer than reading values from its own memory. So now reading memory is not only an effect of how efficient your cache is, but where your data is located. Is it in your local memory or is it in a memory attached to a different CPU? And we call this architecture here with local main memories attached to each CPU NUMA, non-unified memory architecture, which means that your main memory is just split up over different CPUs in your system or different cores in your system. And of course, we have new sets of problems showing up. So how can we actually enable to access data in another CPU's memory? So going from here to here, who decides which of the CPUs is allowed to use the bus? This was a problem already in the previous case. And of course, is a common bus still an efficient method to use here? So we see we have very complex memory hierarchies. We have cache levels. And now we have also distributed main memory where depending on in which memory your data object or instruction is located, uh, well, essentially it takes longer or uh, 
less time to actually access it. So here I found a picture of a PC system board for a NUMA system. So under these big heat sinks here, you find two CPUs, so CPU 1 and CPU 2. And you see these SIM slots here on the side are the local NUMA memories. So these ones here are the local NUMA memories uh, that are part of CPU, uh, that belong to CPU 1, whereas the ones on the right hand side are the local NUMA memories belonging to CPU 2. You see here, these are two separate CPU sockets, whereas you could also have one single CPU socket with maybe one set of NUMA memories on the left-hand side and another one on the right-hand side. On top here, you see our I.O. bus. So these are PCIe slots where you can attach things like storage controllers, network controllers, or graphic cards, for example, which both CPUs can access, but they need to decide which of the CPUs gets priority accessing the PCI slots uh, that are contained here. So this is, of course, still using a joint bus system. And this is getting more and more inefficient if the number of CPU cores on your chip grow. So an other idea or a future idea uh, after just using joint buses is actually inspired by computer networks like Ethernet networks. So the idea is to realize a high-speed network also on the chip instead of using conventional buses. So these on-chip networks can achieve very high throughputs and low latencies, and they can be configured in very many different ways. So here we have an example of six CPU cores, and these are connected via a ring net. So you, when one CPU core can send information in one direction and it arrives at the other CPU cores. And in addition, we can have a GPU, so a graphics card, and maybe a system controller, a system agent, controlling system startup, and so on, uh, also attached to the ring. So information can flow, for example, in one direction here. And uh, this can be relatively fast and low latency. In modern systems, not only CPUs can execute code, so most of you probably have a graphics card in your CPU, and modern graphics cards are not only useful to actually render graphics, but they're so-called GPGPUs, General Purpose Graphics Processing Units, and a GPGPU is a massively parallel processor for, well, typical parallel tasks, so things where you do many identical things at the same time, for example, adding two matrices together and this can be used for very many things, obviously for doing 3D graphics efficiently, for signal processing like encoding, decoding videos, for machine learning applications like doing deep learning applications where GPUs are used increasingly to accelerate uh, machine learning uh, applications like face detection, for example, or also for Bitcoin mining, though this has become a bit more inefficient nowadays. GPGPUs have very few features for protecting running code for security because they were never intended to be used for this. Now, traditionally, GPUs were only accessible to a single program. In Unix, it would be the X Windows server for drawing things and other programs then had to go through the X server to get something drawn on the screen. And of course, this was a bottleneck. So what we want in modern systems, we want to be able to share the GPGPU between different programs running on the same at the same time. And the question we have to ask ourselves is how can the operating system actually enable this multiplexed access to the GPU safely and securely? Now, we've hit a point, securely. Security is a, is a thing we haven't talked about so far, but security is a very important point when designing computer systems. And that's, from my point of view, another non-functional property that we have to take care of. So in a modern computer system, you have multiple programs running simultaneously. So for example, you're just doing online banking with an app and you have a video player that you just downloaded from the app store or from somewhere else, just playing some nice video. Now, what you certainly want to avoid is while you use your banking application, that the video player tries to read the memory of your banking application and then reads out your bank account number and your username and your bank password and sends it to somewhere where people want to make use of your hard earned money. So what we need to do is we need to restrict access to non-permitted memory ranges. So we need to constrain a running program to a range of memory that actually belongs to itself.
And we do this with an additional hardware component, which is called the Memory Management Unit, or MMU. And this is used to only make memory ranges visible to a running program that belong to this program. So essentially, the MMU sits somewhere between our CPU and our memory. Each CPU has its own MMU. And depending on the process, on the program running on the CPU, we have a configuration in the MMU that determines which areas of memory can be accessed, for example. And the operating system obviously has to take care of correctly configuring it to ensure security. So the MMU is based on the idea that it can intercept addresses generated by the CPU. These are so-called virtual addresses now because they're no longer directly referring to physical addresses in your main memory. And this main memory can then check if an access to this address is actually allowed. And then it can translate the addresses for which it is okay to access them to the real physical addresses in our real main memory. And this is done using a translation table. So this translation table needs to be configured for certain programs to contain the information about which uh, of the memory ranges can be safely accessed and which are not to be accessed. Now, the problem is that the translation table for each single address would be large. So essentially, if we would just uh, trans want to translate every address uh, of uh, an integer, which is four byte long in a 32 bit system, which has four gigabyte, we would have one billion. So one to the power of um, one times 10 to the power of nine entries in our translation table. So this would use four gigabytes of memory alone, which obviously doesn't make sense because then you'd have no memory left over for your applications and data. So the trick is here to split memory into pages of identical size, which have a power of two, and then apply the same translation of addresses to all addresses in that page. And this is done using this translation table, which we then call a so-called page table. So MMUs originally were separate ICs that sat between the CPU and the RAM on your main board, like that one on the right hand side here, which is from 1982. This is the first MMU built by Motorola for 68,000 systems, the so-called 68451. This was absolutely horrible to program. And uh, some other computers even realized an MMU using discrete components, like the first Sun workstation, the Sun 1. If you're interested in this, here's a link to the technical manual where you can actually read about how this MMU is implemented. Nowadays, of course, MMUs are in, uh, integrated into the CPU chip, and that's a consequence of the progress of Moore's law. So they fit on chip rather easily now. So how does this page table look like? As I said, we're splitting memory into pages of identical size, which is a power of two. And we try to apply the same translation to all addresses inside of the page. And this is done by the page table. What we have to do is to find a good compromise for a page size that allows for flexi uh, flexibility and efficiency, and of course, for relatively low memory use of our translation tables. So typically, these page sizes are several kilobytes in size. For example, they can be four kilobytes, so two to the power of 12 on x86 machines, or on the new Apple M1 ARM processor, the page size is 16 kilobytes. Now, if you look at the size of a page table for a 32-bit CPU, so this has two to the uh, 32nd uh, number of addresses, and we have four kilobyte pages, this means we have two to the power of 20, so around one million pages in our system. So if we would create a page table for our complete four gigabytes of main memory in our 32-bit CPU, we would still need one million entries and each of these entries might have four bytes in size. So we would waste four megabytes for the page table alone. This is obviously, well, today maybe no longer such a big problem with huge memory sizes, but back then when mem uh, memory management units were invented, this was a large amount of memory. So essentially what was done is we use an additional concept, so-called sparse multi-level page tables to reduce the size of the page table because this allows us to only store information about pages which are actually in use. And uh, this means we don't have to store information about pages which are not accessible by the application, because for every access, 
that does not result in a match in our page table, automatically an error is generated. So here's an example for 32-bit x86 processors with a page size as we've seen of 4 kilobytes or 2 to the 12th. Um, so this means all 4096 addresses inside of a single page are translated in the same way. So essentially the last part, this offset here in our address, the virtual or linear address that's generated by the CPU, is never changed. What is changed are the other parts of the address. And here we enable a hierarchy. So we start at the front, the most significant 10 bits here are a pointer into our page directory. So our page directory has 2 to the power of 10 or 1024 page directory entries here. And each page directory entry actually points to a page table. So this page table, again, is indexed by the next 10 bits, so bits 12 to 21. And so again, it has 1024 entries. And if we have a page table entry here, that's valid, then we have actually a 20-bit number here. So this replaces the upper 20-bit of our address by the physical page address, and the lower 12 bits are just then added to that address here. So this forms our physical address. And whenever we, whenever we try to access an entry that's not contained here, then we automatically receive an error message. So another register that's important here is the CPU internal register. This is the CR3 register, and we'll see in a bit what this is good for. So first, take, let's take a closer look at how the memory translation process works. So we've seen the MMU splits the virtual or linear address coming from the CPU into the three parts here, our page directory index, our page directory entry number, our page table entry number, and our offset. Then it starts by indexing our page table with a page directory entry number. From this, it gets a 20-bit number back indicating where our page table entry starts. This is then determined by the 10 bits of the page table entry. And then finally, we get a 20-bit number out, which indicates the upper 20 bits of our page in physical memory. And the exact address is then added by the least significant 12 bits. So we first read the page directory entry address, get the address of one of the page tables. Of course, we can have multiple here. Then we read from that table the page table entry, and then finally we add the offset. What does this mean? Well, this means we need three accesses to actually, yeah, decode our virtual address into a physical address. So the question is, where is this page table stored after all? So as we've seen, this page table can grow large, like several megabytes in size, so it doesn't really fit in the CPU chip. So page directories and page tables are actually stored in main memory. Now remember our diagram here, we know that main memory is like a factor of thousands slower than our CPU. So if we would need three main memory accesses to actually decode every virtual into a physical address, we would make our computer even more slow, even slower, uh, then, well, uh, if we had no cache at all. So the idea here is the same idea as with regular slow memory accesses. We can also use a cache for the page entries, page directory and page table entries. And for this, the MMU uses a very special cache, which is uh, integrated on the CPU chip. And this is commonly called the TLB or translation look aside buffer. So whenever there's a memory translation to be performed from a virtual to a physical address. The MMU first checks our fast translation lookaside buffer because it's used based uh, built using fast cache technologies. If we have an entry for that specific translation, if we do have it, it's returned quickly. And only if we don't have it, we have to access main memory to figure out if there's a valid translation. So the TLB caches the commonly used PTEs these might be the most often used or the most recently used. There are different replacement policies at work, depending on the CPU you have. And again, we see our locality principle at work. So we'll discuss this in more detail in an upcoming lecture on virtual memory, obviously. So what about the operating system then? We see that our new hardware capabilities 
If we want to make use of them, we must ensure that we have ways to use them efficiently. So the operating system's task is to manage and to multiplex the related resources that are implemented by our new hardware capabilities. So the operating system has to continuously adapt to new features our hardware manufacturers are providing. It has to provide code to implement these new capabilities. And very often some different capabilities interact with each other or with other parts of the operating system, making the overall operating system even more complex. And a modern operating system also has to ensure adherence to these non-functional requirements we've seen, so especially security, but maybe also energy or real-time constraints. So the operating system has to do more bookkeeping and statistics to enable this. Some of the non-functional properties contradict each other, so if you want your CPU to run faster, it usually consumes more power. So essentially, if you want an energy-efficient system, you want to keep your power as low as possible, but getting a fast energy efficient system is very difficult to do. And uh, even then, if you know all about the official hardware changes, very unexpected problems may show up. So you probably have heard about the meltdown inspector security vulnerabilities that use so-called side channels in CPUs and operating systems in concert with compilers and even maybe CPU microcode changes need to be applied to ensure that our CPU uh, can securely execute code again without leaking any secrets. And of course, finally, the task of the operating system designer is to build an efficient operating system itself, which means that the operating system should use as few resources for its own operation, so more CPU time, memory, and so on is available to the applications running on top of it. So here's a number of publications if you're interested to dig deeper. So the first one is probably one of the oldest cited computing, computer science publications by uh, John von Neumann. Uh, the first draft of a report on the ADVAC, one of the first electronic computers in the US in 1945, in which he developed the von Neumann computing principles of a joint memory for instruction and data. The second one is very interesting, even if you're only going to write applications. This is by Ulrich Trepper, who works for Red Hat, the, one of the big Linux distributors that are now part of IBM. And this is a paper uh, called What Every Programmer Should Know About Memory. And this gives indications like problems uh, aligning data to cache accesses. So how to get fast with this, how memory protection, memory accesses, and the hierarchies work. So uh, some information about non-functional properties related to energy and memory types are the third reference, which uh, is uh, an old reference from the group I was working in. The fourth one is a reference to Gordon Moore's uh, yeah, detection of Moore's law already in 1965. The fifth and sixth publication are details on the meltdown and spectral security vulnerabilities. And if you really want to dig deep and uh, have a bit of interest in hardware, you can look at references seven and eight, which give details of the very early memory management unit from Motorola and the one that was implemented in discrete components. So you can really figure out how it works if you know a bit about digital electronics in the very first workstation by Sun Microsystems. So that's all for this lecture. Thanks for listening. Until next time.